Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's virtual open house to discuss the Sny Point Outdoor Event Space Project. Thank you for joining us. My name is Nadia Power. I'm the manager for public engagement with the RMWB. I'm very pleased to be joining you tonight to host this evening's open house. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge that this meeting is taking place on Treaty 8 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree, Dene, and the unceded territory of the Métis. So I want to let you know that we've prepared and rehearsed, but we may still have some technical issues. Please bear with us if there are any problems that arise and we'll work through it. Let me give you an overview of our agenda for the evening here this evening and introduce the people joining me for this open house event. With us tonight are Stephen Fudge, He's the manager for public works and Maureen Nekonechki is the project manager of engineering with the RMWB. And then from our consultant team, we have urban systems, Greg Kahn. From DTAH, Yvonne Batista and from Lees and Associated, Eileen Finn. In just a minute, I'm going to be inviting Stephen to give us more background information about the Sny Point outdoor event space and the overall waterfront park revitalization project. And then the consultant team will present two concept designs and provide some additional details, after which we're gonna open the floor to your questions. Throughout the presentation, the question and answer chat feature is available for you to ask questions and to provide your feedback. To protect all participants' privacy, your microphones, and camera have been disabled. Again, to protect your privacy, the Q&A chat viewing cap capability, it's disabled for participants. However, we do have municipal staff monitoring this and all of your comments will be recorded and your questions will be brought forward for our team to answer here this evening. I want to let you know that this evening's event will be posted to rmwb.ca slash waterfront so that you can come back and review it later. And if there are others that you think might be interested in hearing this evening's presentation, you can certainly ask them to have a look at it as well. Now, let me invite Stephen Fudge to introduce himself and the work that brings us here together this evening. Stephen. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Stephen Fudge. I'm the manager of Perks. Uh, which is a part of Public Works, and we're the uh, delivery department responsible for the waterfront revitalization project. So we're ex very excited to be talking to you tonight. Um, want to give a little background on the project. The Sny Point Outdoor Event Space is a priority of Council's strategic plan for 2018-2021, and is part of the overall waterfront revitalization project supported by the Parks Master Plan as well. Um, some of the details in regards to the waterfront revitalization project uh, is that it's divided into two priorities. The project that we're speaking of this evening will focus on the design and construction of a year-round Sny Point outdoor event space. The other portion of the overall project will focus on the remaining design and construction of the waterfront park project, land and public engagement will occur later in 2021. <clears throat> Just to give you a little background on the council motion related to this project, uh, uh, on March 10th, 2020, Mayor and Council unanimously carried a motion directing administration to undertake a project in 2020 to incorporate a year round designated event space, which included supporting facilities and appropriate utilities. The pro this project's location is uh, some of you will be familiar with at the Sny Point and site of some past community events such as Winter Play, Ignite the Night, Red Fist, Athabasca Tropic Council's Cultural Festival, the future site of the Arctic Winter Games. So the goal is to provide an in, in outdoor event site to host a year-round outdoor uh, events in various sizes while creating a pedestrian connections along the waterfront. So thank you. And with that, I'll pass it over to Yvonne with uh, DTH. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Stephen. So uh, 
Um, to start the evening, um, very quickly, I'll go through the agenda, uh, which includes the project boundary, which uh, Stephen just spoke about, some of the guiding principles, the master plan elements, um, and how that developed into the concept design, uh, and then walk through some diagrams that dissect the concept plan um, and uh, show you how it kind of comes back together. And then we'll end with the next steps and discussion. So the waterfront park, uh, as Stephen was mentioning, on the left hand side is a six kilometer long stretch along the Clearwater River and the Sinai. And what we're specifically talking about today is on the right hand side of the screen, Sinai Point Outdoor Event Space. And why we'd like to talk to you today about the Sinai Point Outdoor Event Space is because we would like to begin phase one construction. And to do so, we need to understand what the overall concept will look like before we can start that construction. Um, and we would like to gather your thoughts and comments to help us um, refine the two options that we're gonna be talking about to come up with the preferred concept, which we will come back to you and uh, present and gather your thoughts on. For the first phase of construction, because there will be uh, more than one phase of construction, um, we have a shorter design and construction window. So we know there's permits and um, other requirements for larger scope. And what we can construct this year um, could be things like accessible pathways, lighting, event power, uh, grading of the area, uh, road work and parking lots and addressing the lookouts. And things that take longer to design and to get the permits uh, for construction include things like the shoreline treatment, the benches, welcome circles, and I'll show you what, um, what that means, signage and wayfinding, art and art placement, uh, new plant material, earthworks, and below grade infrastructure. To understand the site, we need to understand the history. Nistawayu, where three rivers meet. The first inhabitants had a strong spiritual connection to these traditional lands. The waterways, shorelines and lands have been central to the identity, lives and cultural continuity of ind Indigenous people as long as the ancestors have resided in the area. The land provides sustenance, economic needs, a meeting place, spiritual and cultural well-being as well as mobility. And we also need to understand about Moccasin Flats. Um, the Métis families were evicted from the land in the late 1970s to early 1980s. The Métis families in the community have suffered intergenerational effects of the eviction and disconnection from the land. In understanding the um, project and everything that happened before this point, we um, considered over 25 guiding documents and there's a very short list on the screen of some of those documents that help to inform the concept design. We also needed to understand the existing site conditions, which as Stephen mentioned is a four season use park. So understanding all the great activities that currently happen on the site, um, touching the water and fishing, the boat launch, uh, different kinds of cultural celebrations, and we want to make sure that we strengthen those uses and um, can help support those moving forward. We also need to take into consideration the flooding and ice jam, since this is uh, a big part of the park and recognizing that the work we will be doing is within the floodplain. So we need to respect that this happens and work with materials in the design that supports this function. Thinking about some of the opportunities and constraints um, and what we can understand, what we can build. Um, some of those items include the pathways, pedestrian lighting, roads and parking lots and new plant material. And we're having a lot of conversations and understanding some other construction scope that's happening right now and is planned in the future. But we are looking into whether or not we can have permanent outdoor event, um, sorry, permanent open air structures such as shade structures, hydro power for events, potable drinking water, uh, and connections to storm and sanitary systems. The next two slides uh, summarize some of the really great engagement that has happened um, before the start of the concept plans. And through the Indigenous engagement, 
um, this is a very high level summary, but we understand that the Sny Point outdoor event space needs to be a gathering space that is physically and financially accessible for Indigenous groups, an area that recognizes Treaty 8, the unceded Métis territories and local Indigenous languages, connects with the water and incorporates Indigenous art, history and storytelling, as well as recognizing the history of the land. Through the stakeholder engagement, we also understood that um, there is a need for a gathering place as well that welcomes all ages, abilities and genders. It's a community space to be proud of and that enhances the natural, beautiful landscape. That it's a community driven design, which is why we're speaking to you today, and that supports the truth and reconciliation. Some of the guiding principles along with the guiding documents um, we took into consideration and those provided a bit of the guide rails to help us in the development of the concept to make sure that we're hitting all the points that we need to uh, to deliver a park that is um, representative of the community's needs. And that includes four season use, a waterfront destination, continuous integrated cultural experiences, an opportunity to touch the water, that has integrated public art and builds and strengthens the flood mitigation. We also need to take into consideration the past guiding documents. We res um, represent Indigenous communities in a respectful and collaborative way, that we generally work collaboratively with the public and stakeholders, and we represent the larger diverse community with placekeeping and placemaking. Some of the master plan elements Understanding all of the things that we just spoke about, our team came together to really synthesize all of that information and put together some images that helped to inspire what Sny Point outdoor fence space could look like. So the larger idea about connecting, because we wanna be able to connect the waterfront to the downtown core in Fort McMurray. We wanna create new spaces and really give people an opportunity to connect in the park. We wanna think about placekeeping and make sure that anything we do is relevant and meaningful. And activate. We know that this is called the Sny Point Outdoor Event Space, so it needs to be able to function for large events, as well as function on a quiet weekend or weekday and be able to feel comfortable in both conditions. And thinking about diversity. So we want to be able to welcome people from diverse backgrounds to the site and to feel comfortable and also think about biodiversity to make sure that we're respectful of the surrounding landscape and some of the beauty that it holds. Resilience, we're working within a floodplain, so we need to be able to choose materials and design elements that work with the flooding and don't fight against it. And innovation, so wrapping together all of those different ideas and being smart with the materials and the applications that we're proposing on the site to work with things like bioswales for stormwater infiltration, uh, to do it naturally without connecting to some of the below grade infrastructure or using things like reinforced turf that would help support large events with the maintenance and also comfort during the events. And now we'll get into the two concept plans. So for the two concept plans, we've given them names and it, the intention is not to replace the existing park names, but to help distinguish between the two concepts. And what we're looking forward to is hearing your feedback and being able to synthesize all of the feedback that we're gathering throughout our engagement and be able to come back and present to you the preferred concept. So for between the two concepts, there are a lot of similar elements and some of these include the um, Reconciliation Trail, which is a pedestrian trail that hugs the waterfront. And in parallel with that would be a separate cycle track um, so that we would be able to separate the pedestrians from the cyclists and be able to hug the waterfront. The number two symbol is the Great Lawn or Ceremony Area. And this would be an opportunity to have some of those large events, perhaps using reinforced turf. And then we also can take advantage of a bit of an amphitheater or a sloped walkway connection. Throughout the entire um, park site, we are proposing accessible pathway connections. So not using stairs, but gently sloping walkways that would connect people from Clearwater Drive, which is at a higher elevation, to the water's edge, which is at a lower elevation. 
we are proposing two beaches, the number five on either side of the existing boat launch, which we're proposing to remain in place. We're proposing, we're showing three docks, which is part of the RMWB's um, current plans, which may be implemented um, this year. And we see Morimoto Drive is in its existing condition and um, would serve the same purpose. And there would be the connection through Harden Street. This is one of the key differences between the plans and I'll get into some of those details shortly. The number six key is showing the flexible use areas. And this area would look like open lawn surrounded by trees. And the purpose of them um, is on a quiet day, it's a space for to kick a soccer ball or play frisbee, have a picnic with your family. Um, and during large events, there would be an opportunity to set up different stalls like farmers markets or craft fairs. Um, and the one potentially could also be overflow parking. And there's a diagram later that speaks to that location. We also see uh, new pedestrian connections between Clearwater and Morimoto Drive, which leads right to the beach area. And then there's several welcome circles, and I'll get into a detail of what that looks like. The existing parking lots are remaining with the option to add some uh, bioswales or to treat the stormwater, possibly to add some trees. And we could look at um, making the parking more efficient to be able to accommodate some more um, parking spaces. I'll just look to the detailed plan. One of the differences between the two concepts is this vehicular connection that would be leading to Sny Point. And right now we're showing that there would be some parking spaces that would be at the point where people can park the cars and come to a welcome circle or enjoy the, the Sny Point itself. We're proposing that the connection would continue to Father Mercury Street and the parking lot and that people would be able to drive during everyday conditions um, throughout the park. I'll move into option two, Sny Landing. And so you'll see many of the uh, same elements, um, such as Reconciliation Trail that hugs along the waterfront, paralleled by the cycle track, and we have that connection coming straight through. You'll see the Great Lawn is similar. Uh, some of those ramp conditions, again, making sure that the site is accessible remains the same. There's several different ramp connections so that there's more of a direct connection from Sharikas to the proposed beach here on the east side of the boat launch, which also remains the same. We see the parking lots here also remain the same. One of the big differences is Morimoto Drive is proposed to be shifted to the south side, closer to Clearwater, instead of against the Sny Edge. And one of the opportunities to relocating Morimoto Drive is that this area becomes a larger pedestrian area. There's no roadway that um, bisects and cuts off access between the open lawn areas and the beachfront. I'll flip to the detailed plan in option two to help highlight what the other differences between the plan from the Harden Street parking lot, we're proposing that this vehicular connection here isn't open to everyday traffic, but it would be periodic vehicular use. So what that means is um, either emergency vehicles or vehicles required to set up for a large event would be able to drive on the surface and it would be rated for cars and fire trucks to drive on. But um, the other option is if um, people uh, requiring assistance need to access um, Sny Point. There's an opportunity to drop people off and then to park your car uh, at, an, at one of the parking lots. Um, and the larger point to this is to really create a pedestrian focused space that doesn't have cars cutting through it um, regularly. This diagram helps to explain those two differences um, between option one Clearwater Commons and option two Sny Landing. So again, option one keeps Morimoto Drive in the existing location, which is the connection from Harden Street and then moving further west um, towards Borealis Park. The, and then the other um, uh, sort of more similar use to uh, Snipe Point Outdoor Event Space as it currently functions is to have this vehicular connection uh, towards the point and then coming out again towards Clearwater Drive. The difference with option two is Morimoto Drive is pushed to the south side 
so that we have that larger um, pedestrian area that is not bisected by cars. And on the east side, this vehicular connection would be only periodic use. So for the most part, this large area, including the Great Lawn, either for large events or for quiet days, would be largely a pedestrian only area. We've prepared several sketches, and again, we're in the very beginning stages of design, but these sketches are a way of helping to visualize what the space could feel like um, if you were in it. So the idea of welcome circles, um, there's a diagram coming up, but we're proposing yeah. five uh, welcome circles. This is an opportunity where the pedestrian path and the cycle lanes uh, come together. They celebrate special moments in the park. They offer an opportunity to connect with the water. There's a fire pit on the ground in three of the five welcome circles. It's an opportunity to sit. We would be proposing different kinds of benches and seating within the site. There would be signage and wayfinding that could talk about the larger region and maybe some specific plants or um, animals that live in the area, as well as new plant material. The second mood sketch is of that amphitheater, uh, which we could take advantage of during large events uh, to provide a spot for people to sit on the grass or the benches. But in everyday use, this provides an accessible pathway connection between the upper level of Clearwater Drive and the water's edge. So again, we can see some plant material, um, possibly a fun lookout um, that helps to create some character in the space and new plant material as well. Thinking about the welcome circles um, at Snide Point, so this is looking north towards McDonald Island. Again, being able to repeat some of the elements so that the larger park has uh, repetition and people know that they're in a, a special place. Um, would also offer uh, seating a fire pit with fire on the ground. Um, a little bit of uh, grading with new plant material um, and also just being able to take in some of the natural beauty in the landscape. Thinking about the flexible use areas, um, they would largely be open lawns surrounded by trees. We would like to see special moments scattered throughout. So in this sketch, we see um, an adult swing set. So being able to uh, sit on the swing and gently swing either with a cup of coffee early in the morning or with your kids. Um, it could be a quiet moment or also be able to use for um, event space. So being able to set up either a farmer's market or a craft market or maybe even uh, different food opportunities. In the background, we see a tall red pole. These haven't been designed, but the larger idea is some kind of marker pole that helps to connect people when you're looking from uh, within the town towards the waterfront. There's something that catches your eye and invites you to come and explore the waterfront. And the last sketch is of the beach. So this is the proposal of being able to touch the water, whether it's kids playing with their sand buckets and, and grabbing a bucket of water to create castles, um, or if people are learning to stand up paddleboard and to be able to launch from the beach. This would be close to Reconciliation Trail, the pedestrian pathway, as well as the cycle trail. There would be signage and different kinds of seating to support um, different users. The bioswale is proposed to separate between um, the two spaces, and there would also be some new plant material. So maybe we'll continue with um, the diagrams. So these diagrams are intended to um, help to illustrate what, um, how the space would function some of the, those accessible pedestrian pathways uh, with the marker poles um, and how um, we would be connecting between Clearwater and the water's edge. Those red marker poles would be an opportunity to link people from the downtown core towards the waterfront and to show people that you're entering a special space. And thinking about um, signage and wayfinding, it's going to be um, a really important um, element that is uh, continuous throughout the waterfront. So again, being able to share information and have standardized signage that people look for when you are exploring the waterfront. Um, and then um, being able to think about uh, regional and local maps 
because this is a regional park and we do want to celebrate the entire region. Thinking about signage uh, through storytelling, history and looking to the future and sharing information uh, such as uh, plants and animals and the environment around the signage. And also being able to incorporate uh, Machif, Cree and Dene languages within the signage as well as English. Place keeping, so being able to celebrate uh, Reconciliation Trail, um, which would be extending from the Métis Cultural Centre to Marine Park in the south. Being able to offer um, accessible fire pits uh, with areas to um, put tents and then being able to incorporate both temporary and permanent art uh, within the park space. And thinking also about traditional and ceremonial Indigenous plants that could be located throughout the park. We are thinking about washrooms and we have heard a lot of feedback on washrooms in the area and we do show a five minute uh, walking radius, which is um, sort of just a general guideline of uh, what the distances are within the site. We are showing option one for these diagrams, but generally these ideas would um, be applicable between option one and option two. Um, we are um, thinking about locating washrooms outside of the floodplain, just being cognizant of some of the ice um, damage in the winter. Um, so this is one possible location, but we do need to think about the ability to service this location. And so we are having ongoing conversations. Thinking about the toboggan slope, we know that there is a popular spot here with um, uh, some seating opportunities and as well as a barbecue. So we are looking to make sure that we preserve that fun use and because we do want this to be an all season um, park. So we are proposing to work with the two existing lookouts, those purple axes, and maybe also help to accentuate those. We are proposing five um, welcome nodes. The three red dots would have fire pits with fire on the ground and the two blue ones would be um, welcoming people into the park, um, assuming if, if they're driving or entering from uh, Borealis Park to mark special entrance locations. And we know that there's some really great fishing opportunities with pickerel, which is really amazing. Uh, so we are looking to foster those and encourage people to continue the use. We're showing sort of the blue lines on the slide, not because we're intending to restrict any kind of use or location, but just recognizing that it does happen at Sny Point and proposing that um, there would be good opportunities at potentially the three docks um, that are going to be proposed. There are the red boxes uh, shown on the plan, similar to the beach uh, mood sketch. So the idea is that there could be ideas of vendor opportunities close to the water whether it be food or beverage or perhaps um, snowshoe rentals or stand up paddle boards or kayaks, but offering a bit of activation of the site uh, to help welcome people to the park. I won't get into this too much, but the larger idea is that we are looking to create diversity, different kinds of landscape types within the park, um, be it beaches, um, groups of trees, lawn, meadow areas, um, to really make sure that this is a diverse uh, environment and supportive of different kinds of ecosystems. And again, thinking about vehicular circulation, um, this is representative of option one. So we are showing that connection towards Sny Point that would be open all the time versus option two, where it is um, periodic use. Um, and we're looking at potentially being able to expand um, two of the existing parking lots or to hold more cars by um, improving the efficiency of the parking. And then with the possibility of number three being overflow parking. So thinking about reinforced turf or something that could support um, vehicular loads. And this is called Sny Point Outdoor Event Space. So it needs to be able to accommodate some really great events. We put some thought into how to um, stage a large event. The orange bubble here is showing a space for about 1200 people standing. They would be able to use that amphitheater slope. The stage could be located here facing that slope with um, a secured back of house. So being able to store uh, musicians uh, equipment, having some security, making sure that space is closed off to the general public. 
um, uh, and then being able to facilitate um, either access during events or being able to set up for large events, having that vehicular connection uh, through the park. Also thinking about some of these green boxes, which would be um, either food or beverage um, or washrooms that would help support uh, that many people gathered in one spot. If there is a very large event or if there's alcohol involved, being able to have a drop off so that people can get to and from the site safely. Um, so that would happen in the Harden Street parking lot. And then thinking about these red boxes, uh, which are in the flexible use area, whether or not those would support the larger event, either for food or beverage or crafts, or um, be able to host a whole different event and be able to have a bit of space between the different um, uses. So, and next steps, um, maybe I will um, touch on where we are and where we're going. Um, so right now we are talking to you about the uh, concepts for this night outdoor event space and this is very preliminary, the very start of um, the ideas of, of the concepts. So there's currently an online uh, survey that is running until Sunday um, we welcome your feedback. We're going to be taking everyone's input and comments and especially um, we're going to shortly be uh, opening the floor and looking for some of your comments and we're going to be taking all of those and being able to refine the design and come back to you with a preferred concept um, that we would like to hear from you again. Um, so all of this is going to be informing um, construction which will be happening in this summer and this is just the first phase. We are going to be having more than one phase. Um, so maybe I will hand it over to Nadia now. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. You know, I've seen the presentation a few times now. That's an awful lot of information to cover. Um, I just want to mention to everybody, Yvonne mentioned the survey that will be open until Sunday, and there are a few different ways that you can get involved and provide your feedback at rmwb.ca slash waterfront. I also want to um, acknowledge and thank Arndis and Alana, um, who work with me as well, and they are behind the scenes this evening and um, just helping to produce and make sure that everything goes smoothly. Now they've let me know that we're experiencing some trouble with the chat site. And so in just a second, I'm going to give you a phone number that you can text your questions to. We have um, Alana who's standing by and she's going to make sure that those get um, forwarded on to me and we'll get your questions out there. So you're going to have two ways that you can send your questions to us. You can text those questions to this number 780-381-0809. I, so again, that number is 780-381-0809. You can also email participate, participate at rmwb.ca. So we'll be watching for your questions to come in through both of those um, those sources. And also after we wrap up here this evening, if there are some other new questions that we haven't been able to get to in our presentation time here this evening, there are um, a bunch of frequently asked questions that you'll already find at rmwb.ca slash participate. And as well, um, if there's anything else new, we will add to those. So even after the survey closes on um, on the weekend, you'll be able to go there and find information about the project. So quickly, I'm checking and I'm just going to be looking at a couple of screens as we go through here now this evening to work through getting your questions put forward to our subject matter experts. So bear with me. This first question, I think this is um, I'm going to direct this to Stephen in just a second. And Stephen, the question is, are you able to define the specific area that will be affected for the project? Stephen. Thank you for the question, Nadia. So the project as a whole will uh, take place for the Waterfront Park project will take place uh, along Macon and Causeway all the way along Clearwater uh, Drive to Raphael Cree and Tom Weber Park. But our first priority is to develop the outdoor event site. 
and and that's the area that we've been talking to you about primarily tonight. So uh, and, and as uh, defined by the council motion, our priority is to create a year round outdoor event site at the Snipe Point Park. So that's going to be our, our fo first focus to get developed. But uh, as you are aware, there were some council motions about the land adjacent to the Athabasca River along Mac Island Causeway. So that's going to be included into the scope of this waterfront park project as a whole. Uh, moving on from the outdoor event site going south along Clearwater Drive and into waterways for Tom Weber and Raphael Creek. So through engagement and, and, and that we'll be looking for opportunities for park space and access to activate some of those sites within those boundaries. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen, for that. And for anybody who's joining us, certainly would be familiar with all of the different uh, landmarks that you've referenced in describing the specific area we're looking at now. And um, as Yvonne talked about, you know, we have our next steps where we are moving right into construction in this year to move forward with the SNI outdoor event space. Now, Yvonne, we have a question here. Um, somebody has asked, is there any indoor space being considered? I'm going to ask Yvonne to, to take that one. So Yvonne, is there any indoor space as part of the scope of this work? Um, that's a good question. Um, so currently the only indoor space potentially would be the restroom facility. We are not proposing a permanent stage. We're proposing that it would be stages brought in to suit the different kinds of events that would be happening um, versus building any kind of permanent structure. We are still looking into the ability to build permanent structures within the floodplain and what that means, means from a maintenance perspective, just thinking about um, the possibility of damage. Um, so right now we're generally thinking about washroom locations outside of the floodplain um, and this being the one location. So that would be the only uh, proposed closed structure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for that, Yvonne. Moving right along, this next question, I'm going to ask Maureen um, with our engineering department. Maureen, if you could um, give an answer to this question, the question is, can you explain what flood mitigation has been completed in the area that we're talking about here? Maureen? Sure, Nadia, thanks for the question. Um, for flood mitigation, uh, we have Clearwater Drive, the four lane section of Clearwater Drive, and we also have Reach One, which which is the elevated trail behind uh, River Park Glens, starting at uh, the McDonald Causeway. Um, Reach Two, which is Borealis Park, is already pre-existing high ground. Um, all of these areas will need to be uh, increased in height slightly. They were built to the 1 in 100 standard and Council has since directed us to build to the 1 in 200 years flood elevation standard. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that, Maureen. We're going to, um, this is another question to do with uh, flood concern, but I, I think that this one would be best directed to Greg. Greg, I wonder if you could comment on this. The question is, what considerations are being taken to build a park on a flood plain? So I'll start with Greg, please. Sure, uh, thanks Nadia. Um, yeah, you know, I, I guess I'll start by just reiterating uh, some of the points that Yvonne made uh, as part of her presentation. She spoke, you know, uh, about resiliency. Um, and first and foremost, you know, that's what we want to achieve here is, is uh, you know, a park that is is resilient over time. And uh, uh, she also mentioned uh, a bit about, you know, what can and can't be built in the in the floodplain. So we're, we're quite cognizant of 
of the elements that uh, you know would be supported in that area um, and being mindful of where we can locate uh, potential permanent structures as well. Um, as we get further into our design uh, details, you know, we'll be looking at strategies related to construction techniques. We'll be looking at uh, different materials uh, that would serve the, the, the function um, ultimately, uh, you know, to ensure durability uh, of the components and, and longevity of the park. Um, as an example, uh, you know, thinking about uh, light poles and things like that, thinking about taller concrete bases um, as one, uh, you know, strategy uh, to be able to mitigate any, any damage that might be done, uh, you know, from floods or ice jams. And then uh, just in conjunction with, um, you know, the projects that uh, Maureen was speaking to, uh, we've got a, a fair bit of coordination to do uh, with her team uh, as well as we're moving through our design to make sure that, um, both uh, our project and, and the pieces that she's working on are, are coordinated and, and in sync so that we can achieve, um, you know, the function that uh, that we want to here. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. And I think that's an important point that you touched on. We're here tonight to talk about the two concepts and we will be, you know, getting into more detailed design. So some of the issues and questions and comments that we're gathering at this stage of engagement will just bring out all of the different elements that we need to keep in mind as we move forward. I'm going in just a second. I'm going to be going back to Yvonne, I think. Um, Yvonne, we'll start with you anyway. What I want to do is capture a couple of comments and then we have a few questions that are all related, Yvonne. So I'm going to try to get to as many different people's questions as I can. So bear with me for a minute. We have this comment that says permanent anchors that could be used to put up large event tents for things such as winter play or summer festivals. We also hear we'd like to see pavilions for shops or rental types. And then we also have the question here, Yvonne, hey. how has infrastructure been thought of yeah, to support future no way. events? So this is all to do with events and how we're looking at infrastructure for events in this space. Yvonne, over to you. Um, great questions. Um, so maybe I will uh, jump to this slide, uh, the mood sketch, which helps to show this again, very conceptual idea, high level, um, but the idea of potentially sort of a secant, uh, half of a secant container being used as um, something that could help with those rentals or uh, the type of pavilion use, I think that you're asking about. and. So this is an opportunity that um, the spaces either could be leased or um, folks could bring their structures uh, to a designated um, hard surface area and be able to have a lease on that for a certain amount of time. Uh, so that could facilitate, you know, kayak rentals, stand up paddleboard, snowshoe rentals. Um, so that is the one idea uh, that we have. Welcome to any other thoughts um, you might have on that, but uh, I mean, definitely giving an opportunity to activate the site to to have a reason, you know, to sign up for a weekend course to stand up paddleboard would be amazing. Uh, I'd love to do it in Toronto, but um, you know, so being able to have a, a reason for people to come and enjoy their waterfront. Um, so the other question you had is about infrastructure, which might be even related to some of these uses. We are in conversations um, with different people about the ability to um, connect to the sanitary uh, and storm waters, well, more of the sanitary um, and potable water to help provide those because sometimes, um, well, oftentimes for events, those are very helpful to have or for some of these um, activations for folks to be able to hook into them. Um, so we are looking into that and because we are in a floodplain, what does that mean and what special precautions do we need to take to be able to tap into um, the infrastructure within a floodplain? Um, and for the permanent anchors for large events, um, 
unsure if those are applied at the surface or if it's something that needs to be uh, put in underground. Um, be interested to understand the difference. Um, I understand for things like uh, teepees that or tents that there is a system that you can use sort of above grade. So if there is a type of reinforced turf that isn't so friendly to being able to be dug into, uh, we might be able to accommodate that above ground. But if you're able to provide thoughts on what that would look like, uh, we could take that into consideration when planning um, some of the, the reinforced turf or uh, different measures to help protect against uh, very heavy use. But thank you very much. Good questions. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. And to the person who sent in uh, those comments and questions, if you had anything else to add, certainly text again or anybody who has any questions. Again, that number is 780-381-0809. And you can also go and provide your feedback at rmwb.ca slash waterfront. I'm going to go back to Yvonne again uh, with this next question. Um, and this is this is a great one. I, Yvonne, I know this is one that you like to talk about and point out, asking if you could pinpoint the biggest difference between the two concepts. Yvonne? Mm. Yes, no problem. Um, so the biggest difference, or maybe I'll go backwards, the similarities are the reconciliation trail, the walking trail, and the cycle track, the large outdoor event space, the accessibility um, with the connections of, of the accessible pathways are the same. The two big differences between the options are the Morimoto Drive location. Option one is what exists right now and currently. Um, so this is the connection to Borealis Park and the connection through Harden Street. Um, we understand that there cannot be a direct connection between the Borealis uh, parking lot and Morrison Street because of um, uh, engineering concerns with the bend in the road and how that's configured. So right now um, we are understanding that we do need to provide that vehicular connection to Borealis Park. So whether or not it stays in its current location or option two is proposing that we can still bring the same amount of cars in that emergency service to Borealis Park, but it would be located close to Clearwater Drive. And the purpose of that, again, is to think about a larger continuous pedestrian space. So if you could imagine on a, a weekend having a picnic with your family and having this great big lawn space, uh, you might be throwing a Frisbee or running back and forth to the beach. All that you need to cross is that bike path and the pedestrian trail versus crossing over a road. The other big difference is this connection uh, between the Harden Street parking lot towards the Sinai. In option two, we're proposing that this wouldn't be open to everyday vehicles to drive through the park, that this would be a pedestrian focused area. Uh, so again, whether that's on a quiet uh, weekday or uh, during a large event, this would be all um, a continuous pedestrian area. Option one is proposing that this would be open to cars all the time. Um, so there would be able to be this um, car connection to Sny Point, which is more similar to what exists today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. And just as you got into answering that question, uh, just as you started, we had another question come in asking if Morimoto Drive were to be moved, what would pedestrian pathways look like? Now, I believe you've you've covered that in, in um, the answer. I think that's what you were just discussing. But the next question, um, it also is talking about access and pathways. Um, and I think that maybe this one is best directed to Greg. The question is, so the comment is we have a large population of seniors in the downtown area. Well, and in fact, I will just add not necessarily just the downtown area. Um, you know, this is a space that we would we would have the whole town and the whole region using. But the question says we have a large population of seniors in the downtown area. What type of pathways 
would be considered for this space. Greg? Sure, uh, thanks Nadia. Yeah, um, you know, as we get more into the uh, the development of the design, you know, one of the, the focuses uh, of our project is accessibility. And so we want this park to, you know, to be accessible and to be able to be used um, by people of all abilities, ages, et cetera. So, um, you know, circulation and connectivity is a big, a big piece of that, you know, making sure that we have trails um, uh, that have gradients that can accommodate um, accessibility. And then also, um, you know, surface materials are also going to play a, an important role in that in, in terms of, you know, being able to accommodate um, all types of, uh, of individuals, whether it be, um, you know, wheelchairs, uh, et cetera. So, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, we've got some work to do still in terms of what that all looks like. Um, but uh, ultimately, we're, we're going to explore um, a number of different approaches uh, with, with the, the ultimate goal uh, to make sure that everybody can use this park easily. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, that's great. And and again, you know, we really do. Um, that's why we're talking to everybody here this evening and over the course of the past number of weeks, we've been engaging with different stakeholder groups and, you know, going to wider public engagement as well as smaller groups that we can um, talk to stakeholders, rights holders in the region that will be using this space. So any and all feedback that you have, we really do want to hear from you. So again, you can text your questions this evening, 780-3810809 or you can go online to rmwb.ca slash waterfront. The next question, now we're getting into more questions about access and a popular topic. I was waiting for this question to come. Yvonne, would you like to talk a little bit about parking? The question is, what would event parking look like? Good question. Um, so. I might answer this in two parts because um, there is the idea of a very, very large event, um, a regional event that would be attracting people. As I understand, um, there are the opportunity, there is the opportunity sometimes for um, more public transit uh, that would be bringing people to the site um, where people will have the opportunity to leave their cars at home or if there are people traveling um, that they wouldn't necessarily park uh, within um, Sny Point, but the option of having a drop-off um, circuit that would be able to bring people close to the event. So that's uh, one idea. Um, and then also, of course, offering people additional pathway connections. So if you are walking from the downtown core, being able to come to the park easily. For um, smaller events, um, and maybe I will... Um, flip to this slide here. Um, so for um, more medium sized events or smaller events, um, being able to keep the existing parking lots functional, being able to make the parking a bit more efficient so we can add some more cars. So this is in the Harden Street parking lot and this is the Father Merck parking lot. So uh, being able to add those as well as the parking lot by Sharika, so that would remain the same as well as Borealis Park. The one option that we are considering is if there is a need for overflow parking, this number three, which is in the flexible use area, which would look like a lawn, but have some kind of reinforcement that would be able to take vehicles without creating any mud pits um, or uh, getting any vehicles stuck. So that would be an option uh, for overflow um, to help support uh, those larger events. Thank you. Thank you. That's a question that comes up frequently in almost all of our engagements. People are interested to know about uh, about parking and if we're building an outdoor event space just to make sure that we do have that top of mind. So certainly I know we're giving that attention. I'm going to go back to Yvonne now with um, four rapid fire questions for you, but they're all about fire pits. So 
these are the questions uh, for you, Ivan. So about the fire pits, somebody would ask, would like you to describe the fire pit design. How are they going to be utilized by the public? How many fire pits are there? And are they accessible to people, to all people with various degrees of mobility? So I'm just going to run through those again, Yvonne, before you um, get into the answer about fire pits. Describe the design. How will they be used by the public? How many are there? And will they be able to be used by people with all degrees of mobility? Yvonne? Uh, good question. So we're currently proposing that um, three of the welcome circles that would have the formal fire pits with fire on the ground um, would be located at um, sort of the visual axis of where Harden Street comes in, but within a, a pedestrian area, um, being able to offer the seating and lighting um, signage and uh, a bit of a quiet space at Sny Point is the other opportunity and um, closer to the existing playground and thinking about that access um, for from Father Mercury. So um, the idea behind um, the fire pits that this would is uh, specifically located close to the parking lot so that there is parking close by making it accessible as well as the Harden Street um, um, fire pit and uh, welcome circle is also close to the parking lot Again, thinking about um, any kind of mobility challenges. Um, with the fire pit at Sny Point, again, um, between the two options, option one would offer the vehicular connection so that you would be able to park very close by um, and be able to access that fire pit. Um, so how they would be used, um, and maybe I will just uh, flip to, um, we have a couple of mood sketches that give a rough idea of what it could look like, but um, the intention is that it would be used either um, as a casual use in the winter time, being able to warm up, especially if there's winter play or something fun going on. Um, actually, we had, were having a discussion and thinking like even if um, by the toboggan hill, roasting some hot dogs um, and being able to have a sort of a fun social event. Um, or there's also the opportunity to be used uh, for ceremonial purposes. Um, so just offering different options and more offering the use, but um, the uses could mean different things to um, different people. Um, so I think I've covered all of the questions. Is that right, Nadia? Yes, okay, thank you so much. Yvonne, thank you for that. And I realize as I was um, listening to you that we're almost at the end of our time. This hour has just flown by. I want to remind people um, you've been texting your questions to 780-3810809 and Alana will continue to monitor that for the rest of the evening. If you have any other questions we haven't gotten to or comments that you'd like to see recorded, um, we will make sure that we capture those. Um, I'm going to send one last question to Stephen in just a second, but I want to remind people too that if we did not get to your questions this evening, or if you think of something else you'd like to ask us, email us, participate at rmwb.ca, go on to rmwb.ca slash waterfront and send in your questions, your comments, whatever it is that you'd like to uh, provide, whatever feedback you'd like to give us. So, the last question I think we're going to have time to get to this evening. I think it's a good one to, to end our discussion on. Stephen, could you talk about um, why is the RMWB focused on revitalizing the waterfront? Stephen. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so the, the waterfront, it is part of our council strategic plan for uh, revitalizing the downtown area and that. Uh, it is supported by our parks the council approved parks master plan as well. We've had a number of council, recent council motions that have uh, been uh, focused on this area and the waterfront, uh, whether it be the uh, land adjacent to the Athabasca River to develop an outdoor year round uh, event site, site at the SNI, as well as recognizing the rich indigenous history and culture uh, that 
with a connection from the Métis Cultural Center that's being developed all the way to Marine Park. So it, it's certainly a recogn recognition of the importance of the waterfront to the community and looking at opportunities to provide access and activating some of those areas that hasn't been in the past. Uh, we've certainly seen well, some recent events like uh, Athabasca Tribal uh, Council's Festival, as well as Red Fest, that the community is very interested in hosting and attending events in this area. So our hopes with this project is to make improvements to that area to better receive those kind of events, as well as create a, a better atmosphere from the day to day when those larger events ain't happening to better connect to our downtown core, to connect to Mac Island, and to take a look at other opportunities along the water uh, the, and, and other park, potential park areas that we haven't seen in the past. Um, you know, being in parks for years, we've had lots of interest from the public about access to the water and that, that sort of thing. So we're very excited to be able to work with our community and, and f learn a bit more about what they want in that area and uh, uh, build something that's very meaningful to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Stephen. I think that that really captures nicely, you know, the, the whole purpose of what we're doing here and why we're having these discussions. And as we've talked about, as Yvonne spelled out for us already, the next steps, we're continuing to gather all of this feedback. We're going to put it all together into a final detailed design, and we will come back to you and show share that with you so you can see what it is we're going to be building there. We'll get started this construction season with that. So that has taken us to the end of our time together. As I've said, go on to rmwb.ca slash um, waterfront, sorry, and provide your feedback there. I want to thank our subject matter experts and the rest of my staff here that have been helping this evening with this event. Most of all, I want to thank all of you. Your feedback is invaluable to us and we do appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to join us here. I hope you'll have a lovely evening, everybody. Good night.